It's a great pleasure this morning um, to introduce Dr. Willie Parker, who's a reproductive justice advocate. Um, he's board certified in obstetrics and gynecology, trained in preventive medicine and epidemiology through the CDC. Dr. Parker provides abortion care for women in Alabama, Mississippi, Pennsylvania, Georgia, and Illinois. He's the physician plaintiff in the federal lawsuit preventing the closure of Mississippi's only abortion clinic, and it currently resides in his hometown in Birmingham, Alabama. His work includes a focus on violence against women, sexual assault prevention, and reproductive health rights through advocacy, provision of contraceptive and abortion services, and men's reproductive health. He's a board member of the Religious Coalition for Reproductive Choice, Physicians for Reproductive Health, and urge, unite for reproductive and gender equity. And every single time we told anybody that Dr. Parker was coming here, they say, oh, we know about Dr. Parker. So he's also incredibly well known in this field as a, a very powerful advocate, something you know that we at the Institute respect um, tremendously. Um, I asked Dr. Linda Prine, who's the head of our women's health program, medical director for many years, and really responsible for all of the, the good work that we do in this area as an organization um, to say a few personal words about Dr. Parker before we get going. So, Linda. He asked me three minutes ago, so <laughs> I don't know. I don't have anything really prepared. <laughs> But what I just want to say is what's so special about Willie Parker is that he takes the time for all of us to hear our stories and tell his story because it is the work that we love and it requires conversation to understand why we go to bat for women day in and day out. And in his case, it's particularly compelling because he's, go he's working in the South which is the most beleaguered part of our country in terms of women's access to care. And he's speaking out about it on the media at every opportunity available. And we love him for that, and we fear for his life for that, and we respect him enormously, and we welcome him here today. Thank you. Good morning. I am delighted to be here and um, uh, grateful for that generous introduction. And uh, Dr. Common was kidding me about, uh, as he said, you have friends everywhere, everybody, everywhere, uh, raise your name. People say, yeah, I know him. But one of the friends that I'm proudest to have and I'm delighted that uh, she is here is Linda Prine. And I thank her for the introduction. I thank her, I thank her for uh, throwing my name around to say he's somebody that we should maybe have and come and talk to us. So thank you, Linda. And I'd like to, I'd like to uh, flatter myself by saying she uh, rushed back into the country just to be here. She was out of the country. I didn't think she was going to be here, but she rushed back in the country just so she could be here with me. So thank you. Um, I want to uh, capitalize on this invitation this morning by uh, trying to make a case for I, I'm not here to do any self-promotion uh, in terms of talking about my work in Mississippi and how unique some people might find it to be that I go there. Uh, I want to use this as an opportunity to convince you that uh, as physicians and healthcare providers, uh, you have a unique opportunity and I would like to argue that you have an obligation to be an advocate for your patients and that means more than just uh, making sure that they get the room that they want on the floor when they're being admitted, but rather you have a role to play in the society because you are, as I hope to convince you, invested with a tremendous amount of trust. And along with that trust comes responsibility. So I'm going to dive in and uh, start. Uh, this slide is a placeholder. I apologize because I didn't have a slide that would uh, allow me to acknowledge who I, we should truly be grateful for as a sponsor, and that is the Reproductive Health Education uh, in uh, family medicine or the READY program. Uh, they are the people who are making it possible for me to be here. They are the parallel organization to uh, the, the Fellowship and Family Planning, which sponsors and uh, uh, supports uh, family planning education in OBGYN, but the READY program supports a family planning education 
in uh, family medicine. So I'm uh, tremendously grateful to the Ready program for, for allowing me to come. So this is where we're trying to go if we don't make it. So you'll know that we had good intentions. And that is uh, what I'm going to do is describe the epidemiology in the U.S. by race and ethnicity and social uh, demographics of uh, abortion and unplanned pregnancy. And I want to uh, uh, illuminate for you the ways in which uh, those realities have been racialized uh, in an effort to be to the detriment of uh, women and families in this country by ultimately trying to undermine and parse away at uh, abortion rights such that they are no longer available. And then I want to discuss, given that that's the reality and that's what's happening, I want to discuss your role as physicians and healthcare providers as advocates in reproductive rights and reproductive justice. How many of you saw Benjamin Button? The movies are familiar with the concept, you know, where the person, instead of being, uh, 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 starting out old and going young, uh, <laughs> I pose this picture to you as a, you don't know if I'm in the midst of a Benjamin Button moment. You don't know if this Afro is in my past or in my future, right? <laughs> so I thought it would be nice to start off on a light moment because I think this topic is heavy, but it's always good to laugh. Plus, it's also my public evidence that I once had hair. <laughs> I still have hair. Now it just grows out of my nose and my ears. So I'd like to start in a place where, to put us on the basis of, uh, this is another way of saying uh, evidence-based practice. The late Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan, the senator from your state, he said a lot of things I don't disagree with, but one thing he said that I, he said a lot of things I disagree with, but one thing he said that I don't disagree with is that we are all entitled to our own opinion, but none of us are entitled to our own facts. And that's my way of saying we're going to, not like Joe Friday, just the facts, ma'am, just the facts. Some of you aren't old enough to know who about Dragnet or Joe Friday, but that was his mantra, just the facts. And life is more than just the facts, because you have to put the facts together in a way, in a responsible way, to actually tell the story. So I want to start with the facts. Uh, well over half, almost half of pregnancies in this country are unintended. Uh, but unintended, as you can see, does not mean unwanted, because of those unintended pregnancies, well over half result in people actually giving birth, and there's a certain number that miscarry, but almost half in, in abortion. And abortions come from the unintended, unwanted pregnancies, or the wanted but lethally flawed ones. As you can see, uh, when you look in the aggregate with regard to unintended pregnancy and abortion, when you look overall at the rates of abortion and unintended pregnancy in this country, they have been on the decline um, gradually to the point, or uh, at some points they seem to be stagnant. However, when you look at things in the aggregate, very important details are lost. And as they say, the devil's in the details. Or the details can tell you what the devil is doing. Uh, when we talk about unintended pregnancy, there's been unequal progress in unintended pregnancy. While overall the rates have stagnated or declined, uh, unintended pregnancy amongst the most vulnerable people, namely those people who are in poverty and people of color, have increased. Uh, the unintended pregnancy, unintended pregnancy rate for um, uh, poor women has increased, while the unintended pregnancy rate for women of means has decreased. And so you can see an average of decreasing and increase that's roughly the same means that things will stagnate and we'll look like, okay, we're not getting any better, and in some cases we're getting better, but in some ways we're not doing any worse, and some people would consider that progress that we're holding our own, but we're not holding our own for everyone. Uh, if you disaggregate and look uh, by uh, socioeconomic status or income, uh, the, this is graphically what we just said in prose. When you look at people who live well above the uh, poverty level, the rates of uh, unintended pregnancy uh, decrease, but when you look at people who are living at or below poverty level, the rates go up. So it's the best of times, it's the worst of times, depending on where you stand. So what another way to look at it graphically is that the disproportionate or disparities is when people have overrepresentation of something that maybe uh, there, there shouldn't be a difference. And when we talk about unintended pregnancies, if everybody has sex and everybody has uh, 
the same biologic function, yet there are certain people, when you look at them by certain characteristics, they have a, disprepared, a disproportionate impact of having uh, adverse outcomes. With regard to pregnancy, as you can see, uh, poor women, uh, of the women at risk for, uh, for, uh, for pregnancy or unintended pregnancy, 16% of them uh, would be categorized as poor, but they make up well over 30% of the uh, unintended pregnancies. Similarly, if you look by race, uh, uh, because being poor and a person of color are oftentimes synonymous but not always the same, the same story holds. Uh, of the women at risk who, are, uh, with, who would be classified as African American or black, they make up 14% of the population at risk, but they're 26% of the unintended pregnancies, and likewise for Latina women. Uh, and then when you put it all together and you look at that, you see that uh, no clear group has is a majority of the folk who have abortions. However, if you put uh, women of color together, they make up over half of the uh, abortions uh, because they make up a higher percentage of the unintended pregnancies. Uh, and uh, but yet nobody has uh, has quote cornered the market, as they say. I put this graph again to uh, kind of. Uh, transition, or not so much transition, but to illustrate another fact. I was looking at the census data. I found this graphic uh, in an effort to find the evidence for what I felt to be true or what I knew by, uh, by um, uh, urban tale to be true. Uh, this U.S. Census data, when they look at where people live uh, and categorize them or classify them by race, and they map them in the country, you can see the hot spots are in the South. And this is a, a demographic uh, map for um, African Americans. And what this shows is as of the 2010 census, 56% of African American people in this country live in the South. So uh, we also know that Southern states are some of the poorer states. So uh, we also know that uh, African American women have some of the highest rates of unintended pregnancy, and therefore they have the higher rates of abortion. So if you take where people live and what their needs are, some of the greatest needs for reproductive health services are in the South. But when you look at the interaction between race and class, race doesn't tell the whole story, nor the socioeconomics. Because if you look at this graphic, as you can see, when you look all the way over to what would be your rights, if you look at people who are well above the poverty level, uh, when you look at it by race, still African American and Latino women have higher rates of unintended pregnancy and, uh, and therefore higher rates of abortion. So race doesn't tell the whole story, nor does uh, class. But what they do show is uh, an opportunity for people to do mischief. Um, and I'll tell you what I mean by that in a minute. And if you look at these concentric circles about the things that determine and influence health, which is something that we're all interested in based on our chosen crafts, these concentric circles show that there are various levels of influence on the health of our patients or on the health of people. So there are the individual patient care issues about the personal health decisions that people make. Uh, and then there's how they get access to the care for the health issues that arise for them. And most of us as healthcare providers feel quite comfortable advocating or uh, addressing those issues. Uh, and then some of us may even be a little bit more daring and would be willing to address uh, uh, kind of uh, local uh, issues around uh, uh, health care uh, with regard to disparities. But as you can see there, these concentric circles represent that there are various things that influence, have influence on the health of the people we provide care for. And you can look at this two ways. One, it demonstrates the various arenas which we as physicians may or may not feel comfortable operating in with regard to advocating for our patients. We certainly, most of us feel comfortable in the first two, but when we get beyond the hospital or the individual care setting, many of us feel uh, uh, impotent with regard to acting on behalf of our patients. And also, another way to look at this, these concentric circles, is that they also demonstrate the various levels of uh, barriers, potential barriers that patients have to break through to get to the, potential, the, the specific solution that they need for their problem. And one of the ways, one of these circles that I would say would represent uh, 
the maybe the circle or a broader societal uh, barrier or impact on the health and well-being of our patients uh, is represented by this billboard that demonstrates the campaign that was mounted by people to stigmatize and racialize the reality of abortion in this country by alleging that there is a black genocide conspiracy and that as a result of that conspiracy, black, women, black babies are at the greatest risk when they're in the womb of their mothers. And some of those billboards popped up here and you all had a very responsible uh, city council person to right away attack and get those taken down. But it started in Atlanta and so there's a mischief where uh, 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 abortion rights are being attacked by vilifying um, um, black women for the epidemiolog epidemiologic reality of having unplanned pregnancies because they have because they have high rates of un unintended pregnancy, they have high rates of abortion. The anti, uh, the people who oppose abortions have taken that information and turned it around to say that uh, there's a conspiracy to uh, kill black babies. Uh, it's insulting on multiple levels uh, from a racial standpoint, but it's also insulting to the point that women are thought not to have the faculties to make decisions about their lives. So there's a tremendous amount of effort to, uh, to uh, stigmatize and marginalize abortion care, and I'm, I'm personally offended that the most, one of the major ways that that's being done now is on the basis of race and vilifying black women. Where it concerns us is these type of efforts have uh, uh, impacted and, uh, and, and, and begun to uh, uh, enter, uh, uh, impact our relationships with our patients. And there's been scholarly um, uh, work done around describing the fact that as there's now legislative interference with the interference with the doctor patient or uh, the healthcare provider patient relationship which for a very long time has been considered a sacred relationship and that's been kept beyond the reach of, of outside influences, but now we see that that's happening in a very real way. With regard to uh, abortion and reproductive rights, uh, this graphic shows exactly what I mean when we talk about legislative infer interference. Uh, and in, in, if you start from 1985 to 2012, in the previous 25 years, in the previous 20 years before 2008, there were only 189 laws, laws at the state level that were targeted at restricting uh, abortion and reproductive rights. But from 2008 through 2012, in a four-year period, there were more laws passed in four years than had been passed in the previous 20. And so there has been this new tone of people uh, feeling empowered to uh, legislate and parse away at what has been the federal law or, or uh, the road decision that allows for women to make the decisions to end a pregnancy in consultation with their health care provider. Uh, that can't be overturned or has not been overturned. And what has happened is now there's been an effort to parse away or to undermine and to gut the provisions of Roe at the state level. What that looks like graphically has been a change in the opportunity for women to have access to uh, reproductive health services in the form of abortion. In 2000, 31 percent of women, if you looked at by the state and county level, 31 percent of women lived in a state that was considered hostile to abortion based on uh, the laws uh, placing barriers in uh, the way of women to make that decision. By 2013, as a result of that, those additional 200 laws, uh, the complex, the complexion of the of the uh, of the country changed in that now 56% of women now live in a county or in a state that is proven to be hostile uh, to abortion care. So uh, we've made it more difficult for women, and it's, the question is, where can a woman go uh, if increasingly the um, the environment is becoming hostile? Uh, we we uh, at Physicians for Reproductive Health. Uh, for on, on whose board I sit, and and we as a national uh, 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 community of reproductive health uh, advocates and reproductive justice advocates believe that uh, a woman's access to the vital services of abortion care should not depend on her zip code, and yet you can see uh, increasingly more zip codes are becoming hostile to this type of care. 
This is a, 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 a graphic. Olima and Jenner are cities in California. They're real cities, and they're north of the Bay Area. They're beautiful cities. And right there, I think on the Russian River, I've heard some of the best jazz I've ever heard out in an outdoor venue. But uh, this, uh, what this graphic demonstrates is that, as you can see, it's 58 miles to Jenner and 13 miles to Olema, but it's maybe 423 miles to abortion. And there's no place called abortion California, although California can be considered sort of a mecca with regard to access to abortion in that it's one of the places where there are few restrictions. But what it says is for all practical purposes, uh, for many women, an abortion uh, uh, is, might as well be a million miles away. For some women, it is 400 miles away. And you can imagine if you're poor and you're in the graphic that we talked about, you're poor with limited resources and you are now have an unplanned, unwanted pregnancy or wanted but lethally flawed one, it might as well be a million miles away if the barrier, the physical barrier of being able to get access to services is very real for you. So what does that look like? These barriers, if you look at the woman and all the things that stand in between her and getting access to abortion care, which is now clinic-based, but I hope, and part of the beauty and one, one of the reasons I was so uh, uh, pleased to, to accept this invitation is I, I know that this is a new family medicine program that has as a focus social justice and comprehensive reproductive health. It is my hope, along with Linda, uh, we are, are soulmates in that regard, that uh, abortion access will be uh, as readily accessible as primary care. And that as, a, as future primary care physicians, that you will consider it your uh, opportunity, if not responsibility, to, along with the panel of services that you offer, that you offer comprehensive reproductive health care, which includes uh, access to abortion. Uh, but right now, if for the sake of simplicity of argument, we're going to say the opportunity for abortion care exists in an abortion clinic. There, in so many places, namely those 31 states that we describe, that that the map shows you have now become hostile. Uh, various and sundry barriers are put into place uh, in front of women. If you look locally, in some places, there's no provider or there's an institutional refusal to uh, offer services. One such place is the state of Mississippi, where I now uh, uh, see women uh, having made the decision to go to the work at the only clinic in that state. Um, Sometimes uh, multiple states offer parental consent requirements under the common sense notion that you know all parents should know about what's going on in their children's lives, and I think it's, it's true. But there are some things where it becomes a barrier if uh, a young woman needs to tell her parents about an abortion. Uh, there are insurance bans, despite the effort to uh, in expand coverage. There are uh, specific laws prohibiting the use of your insurance coverage to, for abortion. There's waiting periods now in some places up to 72 hours. Uh, in Mississippi, it's 24 hours. And in some places, the waiting does not include uh, weekends or holidays. So imagine if you will, when the 4th of July falls on a Friday, as it will this year, if you consent on Thursday, uh, and you have to wait 72 hours. Friday, Saturday, Sunday will not count. Your 72 hours start on Monday. And so you consent on Thursday. So what is 72 hours actually becomes a week. And if you're already on the last day where you can legally have an abortion in that locale, you have pretty much been denied your access to your opportunity. So there's, uh, uh, I was going to say brilliance in these laws, but actually it's, I reserve brilliance for positive things. They're dastardly, uh, clever schemes that various, in various ways prevent women from access to their, their right to uh, health care and privacy. Uh, there are mandatory ultrasounds forcing patients to interact with information that does not add anything diagnostically or, or care-wise to the care. There are hospital admitting privileges which is the barrier that has been used to prevent me from uh, uh, gaining uh, 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 hospital privileges in, in Mississippi, and thereby if the, if the injunction blocking the implementation of that law were not in place, the only clinic in that state would close. So you can see there are various things that are used to build a, uh, an almost insurmountable barrier, 
And I think it's apt that the wheelbarrow and the bricks are on the side because there are increasing ways in which people are trying to make that wall wider and taller. Oops. The late, great Maya Angelou said, when I knew better, I did better. And I've taken that as a missive to say that, in another way of saying that, to know is to become responsible. Part of my goal today is to highlight these realities for you because you may very well leave and decide that it's not your battle and not your fight, but you will never be able to say that you didn't know. I want to introduce the radical notion that reproductive rights are human rights. And as human rights, we should all be committed to the defense of human rights and the value of each uh, person's humanity. And as a result, that makes you responsible to work on behalf of reproductive rights if you fancy yourself to be in favor of human rights. One particular context, what, do, what does human rights look like in, uh, in, a, in a reproductive rights context? It's called reproductive justice. It's not just abortion access, it's not child care, it's not uh, safe birth and motherhood. Uh, it's all of those things. It's the right to determine when, whether or not, and if you are going to become a parent, the right to prevent pregnancies, the right to end a pregnancy that you couldn't prevent, the right to have resources to responsibly parent your children. And that's the three-legged stool. I have an additional leg to my stool, and I'm going to write this up because the traditional understanding of reproductive justice does not include this, and that is the right to primary sexual pleasure. And I describe that as when we uncouple sexuality from procreation. It opens a whole other range of, if we assume that the right to healthy sexuality is a primary human right, then that means that we have to be concerned about the ways in which uh, uh, people's ability to decide who they want to be sexual with and who to love is impacted, uh, as well as what constitutes a healthy family. Is it only a nuclear traditional understanding of family? These all become issues of reproductive justice when we uncouple reproduction from sexuality. But that's another talk for another time. So if I've convinced you, at least in part, that um, we have a responsibility to do something about what we know, uh, then uh, as the late Mahatma Gandhi said, uh, we, should be, we have to become the change that we wish to see. Now, this is not a moment of egomania or megalomania. I did not put this slide together. But someone put the slide together uh, to remind me, and I use it to remind myself to talk about what does it meant to me when I said that when you know better, you do better, and to know is to become responsible, and that you have to become the change that you wish to see. What that's meant for me at this stage in my life was making the conscious decision to go to Mississippi to become uh, a provider of abortion care in a place where women had the greatest need. Uh, the the um, shot on C-SPAN as last summer I had the privilege of testifying before uh, Congress and a hearing on the Women's Health Protection Act, which sought to uh, block the kind of uh, random imposition of state-level laws that are unconstitutional on the basis of the content of, uh, of the Roe decision. Uh, and um, uh, just the whole, the podium at Physicians for Reproductive Health is as my friend uh, Dr. Prine alluded to, I've made a conscious effort to every chance I get to raise my voice to stand on behalf of what I believe is the right thing to do, and that is to advocate for women to have reproductive freedom and to be in control of their lives. Now, when I made the decision to go to Mississippi, uh, while, however noble I thought my actions were, uh, not everyone was happy to see me. You need to repent before it's too late. Go in there and count. Tell me how many blacks you got in there. Plus how many whites. It's genocide. You gonna count for me and tell me how many are black and how many are white? Are you gonna do that for me? Why should I do anything? And genocide. Okay. Genocide. Oh. <laughs> 
participating in an extermination okay. of your own and, race, and what are you, you, participating in you are a disgrace. Thank you. You are a disgrace to the medical profession. Did okay. you take the Hippocratic Oath before you became a so-called doctor where it says you'll do no harm? The first thing is to do no harm. A doctor is supposed to protect life, not exterminate it. You need to repent before it's too late. That was unintentional, but that's practically what happens because he's there. He, he's there every week. And um, first of all, I, I recognize that for some of you that is uh, was uh, potentially traumatic. So let me say to you, that was probably far worse for you than it actually was for me. But I did think it was important for you to understand that. Um, as Frederick Douglass said, power concedes nothing without a demand. And there are people who are very vested in seeing the world a certain way. And in their, their way of seeing the world, women are, should, be, should play a subservient and second class role. And one of the ways that they fancy keeping women in their place is by keeping them in levels of reproductive oppression, by shackling them with the primary responsibility of childbearing, such that their lives are encumbered by the decisions that go with that. And they are vested in that in ways that they understand religiously and otherwise. And so they will oppose anyone or anything who uh, tries to, uh, who, to change that, that notion in that order. Um, for me, uh, the decision to make, to, to go, is related to um, my own particular religious and spiritual understanding that for me, even though the specific context for me is Christianity, in all the great faith traditions, and even in the great tradition that does not require faith of humanism, the most essential value of all of humanity has to be compassion. And compassion and love is the deepest uh, feeling and the, and, the most, uh, and, the, and the most profound action that you can do on behalf of another human being, and that is to respond to their need at the time. And for me, uh, it became totally consistent with my religious and spiritual values uh, that I find Christianity to hold of deep compassion for another individual. And for me, that compassion included abortion care. And for the first 12 years of my practice, uh, I did not provide that care, but it was as a result of wrestling with my fundamentalist understanding as a, as a born again Christian and then I was born again from being born again uh, in the South. And for me what that meant uh, was, even though I didn't have any explicit teaching about uh, abortion being wrong, uh, I, it was kind of implied given that the many teen pregnancies and uh, single parent homes that I saw, women would expect to continue pregnancies that occurred to them. And so I wrestled with that from the start, from college to medical school and for the first 12 years of my practice until I finally, um, for the 15th time, I exaggerate the number, but finally heard in a sermon by Dr. Martin Luther King where he took the story of the Good Samaritan and talked about what made the Good Samaritan good. And in this story, this, this, the story, the, the person who was injured as a traveler was happened upon by uh, robbers and was left on the side of the road injured. And the people in the community all just passed the person by. This person was from their community, but someone outside of the community came. Uh, that person is in our public, in our common lore is known as the Good Samaritan. That person stopped to help someone that he didn't know and, 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 and helped him to, uh, to, to uh, get to safety. And Dr. King took that story and said that what made the Good Samaritan good was Whereas everyone else passed by that person and said, what will happen to me if I stop to help him? The Good Samaritan reversed the question of concern and asked, what will happen to this person if I don't? And for me, that resonated deeply as someone who on a regular and daily basis saw patients who, were, uh, who had unplanned, unwanted pregnancies or wanted but lethally flawed ones. So it, for me, it became not only uh, totally consistent with my particular religious understanding to offer compassion and care to someone, it became a moral and ethical obligation. Uh, when I know what women face when abortion is not available, it became morally and ethically my obligation to provide that care. So it allowed me to overcome any concerns about what might happen to me.
if I did this care as opposed to what would happen to the women if I didn't. And so I share that with you, not as a proselytizing move, but I, if you are, if one of the reservations or concerns you have about what it would mean to be a reproductive health provider and include abortion care in your practice, it, I would challenge you to look deeper in, if it's a religious thing for you, to look deeper in your faith tradition and see what it is that if you weren't concerned about what other folk would think of you, or if you weren't concerned about taking another approach to your religious understanding that would lead you to uh, embrace the compassion that I know if you have uh, one of the mainstream faith traditions is there and present, then I challenge you to look deeper so that that will not be a barrier for you. So in addition to that, I don't see my obligation to help stopping at simply the provision of care. I see my obligation as a trusted individual in the society to also advocate for my patients in the farthest reach of those concentric circles that I showed you earlier. And, that, and that's one of the things, that's why I'm here, what I want to challenge you on is yourself, to see yourself uh, as a physician and advocate. Some of us hide behind the, oh, I'm a physician, you know, advocacy and, you know, uh, marching or going to the, the White House. You know, I don't have time for that. I have to see my patients. I have to create access. Well, if you don't shape the context in which your patients are seeking care, you won't even have the chance to put on your white coat and go and provide the care that you uh, are most interested in. So as physicians, when we look at the way in which our profession is being impacted by laws that aren't based in evidence or that people who are making the laws who are not physicians are imposing upon your ability to practice your craft, you have two decisions to make. You have to decide whether to fight or to give up. Dr. King said there's a time where silence is betrayal. And so in becoming responsible, once you know what women face and what the outcomes are, just like you would be remiss if you have a clinical encounter with a patient where they trust you to make health recommendations and you know that they're smoking and you don't say, you know, you're really ought to quit. There's a way in which you betray your patients when you don't make the best re recommendation for their health care. And there's a way in which you don't preserve options for your patients that you're betraying them if it's solely within your power to just raise your voice because of the influence you hold. Oops. That was, there we go. Oops. Technology. So let me kind of break it to you gently. While we hold a tremendous amount of public trust, we as physicians are not the most trusted individuals in society. Nurses and pharmacists are, right? But we are a third. So we did meddle, and this is in Gallup polling, that when it comes to our influence and the, 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 the tremendous uh, uh, opportunity we have and the weight that we carry, we are, uh, we are a third in the, the people who are traded as, who are considered to be honest and ethical. We rank high above journalists, who are shaping the context like Fox News, and I'm not betraying any of my political. Fox News and MSNBC, how's that for balanced uh, journal, journalistic indictment? As well as lawyers, governors, senators, and members of Congress. We rate much higher than them, and yet these are the people who are running the country and making the decisions. So you have a tremendous amount of moral and uh, a political authority if you would but use it. Here's that political influence in play. Um, uh, last year in West Virginia, the governor vetoed uh, a bill that would impose a 20-week ban on abortion in the state of West Virginia. And in his veto language, he cited that the bill was problematic because it unduly restricts the physician-patient relationship. And he said, the medical community has made it clear. He heard, but in order for him to hear, someone had to speak. He said, the medical community has made it clear that these penalties, which was the threat of throwing you in jail if you violated the specific rules around doing an abortion. He said, these, these, the medical community made it clear to me that this imp impairs their ability to provide care for their patients. So I'm going to veto this bill. He couldn't make that statement if he hadn't listened to healthcare providers. He couldn't listen to healthcare providers who weren't speaking. So it does matter when you speak. 
I put this in to remind you that good and moral women have abortions every day. Just as I demonstrate, or at least articulate for you, why I insist on holding on to my religious identity and articulating the fact that in the context of my identity that I provide abortion care. I say this because the major push to deny women access, people represent their moral authority as based on their particular religious understanding in their particular religious identity. And I know a lot of us have religious PTSD. I know a lot of us have triggers, and we don't want anything to do with religion, so we hide out in science. But if you do have a faith identity, if you continue to practice, or even if just, if you just socially go to church, you know, there are like people who are observant, and there are people who are social, socially religious. If you are in a faith community, it is very important for you to, you to use the tremendous moral authority that you hold as a trusted individual of society to push back, because even when you insist on maintaining that identity in the context of providing controversial care, you create a counter narrative that pushes back against this uh, moral imposition on our patients that when they make health care decisions in their best interest, that they're doing something wrong. So I put this in, again, it's not a moment, another moment of megalomania, but it's a statement that says we have to be conscious to make sure that our patients understand that there's nothing mutually exclusive about taking care of themselves and making a, a, a good health care decision and, and their, cho their, their particular belief. I say that because uh, anybody who does abortions, I know my experience has been, if I had a nickel for every time a patient sat up on the table and asked me, do you think God's going to forgive me for killing my baby? You know, that is not the time for me to say, uh, I don't do religion. Right? She's not asking me for a theological discourse. She's asking me to make sure that she, to validate that it is okay for her to take care of herself, despite all of the, 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 the noise in the air to the contrary. So, what does I really want from you? I want you to become, I want, I want to challenge you with the notion that you have a responsibility as well as an opportunity to become politically active. You have an obligation because you have tremendous public trust. Uh, you have privilege. Uh, you are a national investment. Your, he your education and training is heavily subsidized by uh, governmental funding, and therefore you are a, a public resource. And more importantly, you should want to do what's in the best interest of your patients. And as a result, what that means in this day and age is that you have to become politically active, not for any particular party. When you talk about political, when you assess, now when I told you about all this stuff, it's really easy for you to say, well, we've already been swallowed by the snake. I love cartoons, so anything I have a, a reason to put a cartoon in, I do. Now, there's nothing mousy about physicians except physicians who refuse to do advocacy, okay? Um, but I use this as a, as a, you know, in terms of your perception of your role in politics. Uh, the Mahatma Gandhi said, if I seem to take part in politics, it's only because politics encircle us today like the coil of a snake from which we can't get out, no matter how one tries. Another way is to say we're stuck in the matrix. I love that movie. Um, but given the inevitability in that we're entangled in politics, whether we want to or not, based on everyday decisions that are made in our lives that are political, we simply have to make the choice to wrestle with the snake. And I hope that you feel compelled to do so. So what does that look like? First of all, you must exercise your most, your most essential uh, uh, right as a citizen. That is that you have to vote. We tend to not vote, but I was on call and I couldn't get off. Well, you know, you have to find a way to vote. People have died uh, for the right to vote, whether you're talking about if you're a woman or you're a person of color. Uh, there have been uh, men who fought each other for the right to vote. So. There is blood in the soil on every level for the right of franchise in this country. And so it is a shirk of your civic responsibility if you fail to vote. I didn't tell you how to vote, but if you think about your right to exercise influence, your voting should be informed by how people behave politically with regard to the issues that you care about. You should run for office you know, if in your spare time uh, as a first year <laughs> resident. Um, we have physician legislators, but they are rare, and many of them are megalomaniacs, and a couple of them will run for president. Uh, we have, uh, you, you know, through their opportunities to lobby legislatures, uh, through PRH, uh, that's, uh, if, if I fall dead right now, the last thing you should remember is that Google 
PERCH, PRH, PRH, and join PRH as a physician. It will create opportunities for you to become politically active and to lobby it and to advocate on behalf of your patients. And I can, one of the most, uh, the most exciting things about being on the Hill is when uh, uh, the legislators who enjoy seeing us come in our white coats, first time I went on the Hill in my coat, it felt kind of hokey because I'm like, you know, I'm an adult. Why am I dressed as a doctor on Halloween on the Hill? But when I saw Miss, Miss, Miss Tobacco Farmer and all the Brownie Scouts and everybody is in their little uniforms, I realized that it was a part of the drill. And so that's, uh, once, you, once you get over the excitement of having a white coat as a doctor, probably about the only other time that I wear my white coat is when I'm on the Hill. And it is my mantra and as a medical deity, and we go and use our powers on behalf of your mortals for good. So I would encourage you to keep your white cape and put it on and go to the hill. Um, but when we go and they say, now, are you sure you're not here for tort reform or, uh, or, or uh, in, in reimbursement approval, uh, uh, improvement? And say, no, I'm here on behalf of my patients. They really get off on that. And they really want to see you because it is, <laughs> OK. <laughs> Reproductive justice, sexual freedom, whatever it gets you off. Um, they really get excited because it is the stories that make a difference. And nobody has the patient stories but us, right? You see the woman who her IUD failed and she now needs uh, an abortion. You see the woman who uh, was diagnosed in her pregnancy with breast cancer in the sixth month, gave birth, and then 11 months later, uh, when she went for her, after her mastectomy, when she went for her, uh, her reconstruction, there was a metastasis in her scar. And so now she's having an abortion because she's 10 weeks pregnant because she wants to stay alive for the two kids that she already has. I saw that woman three weeks ago in Mississippi. So you have those stories, and those are the stories. We often like to think that policy is driven by data, but it is not. It is driven by anecdote. It is the stories that you have, and nobody has more stories that are compelling than you as a physician. So I encourage you to use those stories on behalf of your patients. So someone said the first job of a citizen is not to close their mouth, but rather to keep it open. And I would ask that you would exercise your duty and responsibility as an informed citizen, as a physician, to advocate on behalf of your patients. You need to have faith that it does make a difference when you go. There's an African proverb that says, if you think you're too small to have an impact, try going to bed with a mosquito in your tent. <laughs> so in that same, small things can make a big difference. One of my heroes says it best, uh, uh, Bishop Desmond Tutu said, do the little bit of good where you are. It's those little bits of good that when they put together, they overwhelm the world. You don't have to move to Mississippi. There are five boroughs with a lot going on right here. There's New Jersey. Wherever you are, you can make a difference <laughs> wherever you are, right? Uh, did I say a New Jersey joke? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> Um, and so the, on my final slide, there are two, two, I, two things that I, these are my two, my two parting thoughts. One thing that I ask you to bear in mind is something that I revisit all the time in terms of my role and my impact on the world and what I want my legacy to be. My legacy should not be uh, my name on a building, but rather someone once said that societies grow great when people plant trees under which they will never sit. That means that you have to entertain the notion that something that you do, a decision that you make, an action that you take, should benefit people for years to come. And the final thing that I try and visit as often as I can is one of the wisest people I know was Dr. Seuss. And in his book, The Lord, he said, and you should, check, you should say this to yourself, you should look in the mirror and you should say, unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing's going to get better. It's not. So, on that note, I'll close. I want to thank you for your attention. I hope that you feel like you uh, can make a difference, because whether you know it or not, you can. And I hope you rise to the occasion to do so. Thank you so much for your attention. Well, that should be first thing on a Monday morning. That, 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 it's so powerful. You know, um, one of the things we talk about 
at the Institute all the time is the responsibility to work on an individual level with patients, but also the responsibility we have to look at what we learn from our patients to take social action all the time because um, there are so many inequalities. And I think um, you are just uh, uh, an amazing example of that in, a, in an area that is just so needy. Um, we have time for questions. Please ask questions into the microphone so the remote participants can hear you. Comments? Go ahead. Um, uh, we have a, a question that came in from actually two of our webinar participants, um, Keely Robinson and Rebecca Duncan, who are both nursing, nursing students. And they ask, what do you see the role of RNs being in this fight for improved access to comprehensive care and uh, to further the, the cause of reproductive health and justice moving forward? I see the, the, the role of, of nurses, and I, was, uh, I tried to neutralize my uh, language around specific role uh, in terms of doctor nurse to say healthcare provider, nurses are healthcare providers. And I think their role is critical because in order to implement, in, every order that I've ever written was implemented by a nurse. In uh, many of the rules that are being drafted now because of the known nursing shortage, uh, for example, in Mississippi, there are, uh, when they force clinics to operate as ambulatory care centers, that has implications for staffing ratios. So uh, there are nurses who uh, don't perceive their role. They see themselves as in a helping, healing role. There are many nurses who uh, don't necessarily see that they have a role in securing access to abortion for women, and yet in places where nurses are required for a certain staffing ratio, if there are no nurses to achieve that ratio, women don't have access. So I think nurses have to, as, as physicians, socialize their peers around raising the understanding of uh, reproductive rights and social justice. They have to make sure that that is considered a core uh, value and competency in, in their care. Um, I think ultimately, um, uh, abortion care should be uh, competency driven. I see no reason why as a trained licensed individual that we should not be on a path towards uh, equipping nurses to provide uh, abortion care, whether it be the administration of the pill or uh, evacuation of the uterus. There are many more. If you can put in a, I'm more afraid to put in a central line than I am to do an abortion. I know that there are nurses who can do that. Um, so it's not to compare degree of difficult what you have to have is a willing heart, because if you have a willing heart, you can be trained. And I think we should remove any barriers for nurses being able to participate fully in reproductive justice and provision of those services. So you should see yourself as a reproductive justice advocate, and hopefully one day we'll be able to make you an abortion provider. Thank you so much for your presentation. A question I had was, given that Mississippi itself has had such a historical legacy of oppressing African American women, I mean, they had the forced sterilizations and the Depot Provera trials, how have, what barriers have you encountered um, in terms of getting that population to trust you in providing abortion care? Because I'm not sure, I'm sure that people aren't just running towards the clinic saying, oh, there's free abortion. I mean, there's been such a historical legacy of oppression through fed federally funded programs and things that actually seem like they're doing good for the population. Yeah. Well, I think um, sort of there's certainly the legacy of abuse on the basis of race, uh, the abuse of authority and power, the uh, uh, devaluation of people on the basis of color and gender. Uh, and that's a legacy that has to be reckoned with. But at the same time, I think uh, people uh, most often interact with what their lived realities are. and. Uh, for women who need and choose abortion. Uh, those women will even go to, uh, given that before abortion became legal, women went to people they didn't know anything about and weren't sure what their motives were. Uh, even now that abortion is legal, even when people, uh, they know by legend that folk are doing uh, uh, terrible care, like um, in Philadelphia where uh, the person was providing abortion care uh, and women were harmed. Uh, women will go to a bad abortion doctor when they real, when they when they when when a woman's 
uh, determined to end the pregnancy, she'll go wherever she needs to go. So um, the biggest, what, what I've experienced mostly is women have been relieved and grateful that, there's, that that clinic is open and the questions of trust haven't come up. Uh, but uh, in terms of addressing those uh, in, a, in, a, um, in a proactive way, and also, it, it also stands to reason that why the black, the black uh, genocide argument hasn't caught on, because women, when they know they need care, they know what they need to do, and they seek that care out. So uh, when the issue comes up, I think it definitely has to be addressed head on, but uh, most, most folk are just kind of operating void of a historical context. It's like, I, I'm pregnant and I don't need to be, where can I get help? Uh, but to the degree that those of us who know about these things, we need to reconcile and make sure that the policies that come up are, in, are informed by these harsh realities so that we can avoid repeating the past. So I have a question about, you know, there's such a close relationship between insurance coverage and race. Um, throughout the country and even here in New York City. So how do, you, how do you deal with the provision of a service like this, and especially contraceptive services, which can be very expensive and things like that, um, given the fact that so many of the people that you see must have insurance issues, either that Medicaid's decided not to pay for abortion, or, and, you know, how do, how do you deal with that? Well, uh, people, have always been, uh, particularly people who live in crisis mode, and I would say many people who live in poverty, if not most people who live in poverty are in crisis mode, they, they, they live from one crisis to the other. Abortion just becomes one of those crises, and uh, I, one of the ways I deal with that is one, you know, I can't change the overall social context or economic context, although in my role as advocacy, I try to do that. But uh, in lieu of that, I try to make sure one of my one of the things I think is just making the service available and figuring out how to secure the resources. I think uh, when 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 we can control uh, funding mechanisms or clinic space, uh, being able to uh, try and put services by being uh, um, you know uh, evidence-based care is often uh, uh, economically. Uh, 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 streamlined uh, and so to the degree that I can as an individual provider I try and do all that I can to put this vital service in the reach of patients by advocating for it being considered health care by uh, combating funding restrictions but in lieu of that you know where I can when a woman gets to my attention doing all that I can to try and help uh, her to overcome those barriers it becomes very important for me in that regard to participate in uh, like uh, uh, fund, uh, funding mechanisms that arise that are not government-based, like abort independent abortion funds, where they do fundraisers so that they can try and supplement and offset economic barriers, uh, arguing for creative ways to look at the Affordable Care Act, uh, uh, being very creative and very aggressive and looking at Medicaid funding and saying, right after an abortion, if a woman's eligible for Medicaid and she can get an IUD, uh, one minute after the abortion, she's no longer pregnant. And so now she can get an IUD. So uh, choosing to look at things <laughs> when I can to ask forgiveness and not permission, uh, if that's in the best interest of my patient. So you have to think creatively uh, and understand that thinking creatively, and ha I have no issues trying to outsmart legal barriers. I don't consider that unethical. I don't consider that illegal. And uh, if I get caught doing that, then I'll pay the penalty. I'm not advocating you break the law. <laughs> but what I'm saying is you've got to think creatively about how to make things happen for your patients. Thanks. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering about... Let me say I like your hairdo, by the way. Oh, thank you. Right. <laughs> We go to the same barber. Yeah, the, um, I'm just wondering about the role of faith-based organizations in terms of advocacy. And when you think about what's happened around the issue of homosexuality and the role of women in faith-based organizations, there's been incredible movement. Yes. And um, so I'm just wondering, when, when, you know, in terms of your approach to this and, and advocacy, are there strategies to reach out to faith-based organizations 
and try to, you know, there, there's almost, the, what are the leverage or pressure points to begin to identify leadership in those organizations, much like that has happened in, you know, with issues related to the rights of homosexuals and the role, the role of women in leadership in churches? That's a fabulous question. Uh, uh, as was cited, I'm a poor, I'm a member of the uh, Religious Coalition for Reproductive Choice, uh, which, is a, which is a coalition of faith-based leaders across various faith traditions that uh, have as a part of their understanding of their faith that uh, the sacred ability of women to make choices about reproduction is consistent with the tenets of those faith traditions and should be supported and advocated. Uh, the clergy consultation service out of, uh, uh, I think it was Judson Memorial Church and Howard Moody, uh, when women, when abortion was illegal, they had a, they had a, a, a clandestine network of doctors that they would, women would see and they would steer them towards the care. I think the courageous action of people who are willing to see their faith traditions in a different way and who refuse to relinquish uh, is the key. I think uh, uh, there are targeted efforts like through RCRC where there's right now a campaign going, going on called It's Time where uh, they have content for clergy to to, to they bank sermons and uh, have uh, meetings and that kind uh, and encourage the development of reproductive justice wings of various faith traditions. So there's active movement in that regard. Uh, I think the synergy will come from those of us who do health care and who again recognize the value of the faith community as allies and partners, even if we're not people of a specific faith tradition. Uh, if we can overcome our religious PTSD enough to work alongside them, uh, they, they become valuable partners. The reason I think that they are so valuable and that our effort, any effort not to include them as misguided is based on the fact that the tremendous amount of authority that we hold in the community, uh, at the end of the day, people don't come to the academy to figure out how they feel about something morally and whether it's right or wrong. They go to what I call the value issuing institutions, their communities of faith, uh, and, and other places where they get their understanding about what's right and wrong. So there are uh, specific efforts, but I think uh, there has to be an outrage from the reproductive rights, reproductive justice community to enlist partners. Uh, to the same degree, the mischief has been done where the antis have forged partnerships and unholy alliances, like for example, the black church where abortion is a, an open secret, the majority of the laity is female, the majority of the leadership is male, and the antis kind of co-opt the kind of small c conservative values of the black church to kind of say, if you're a Christian, you have to think about abortion this way, and then, you know, people who are, are, are in leadership say, yes, that is right, abortion is wrong, and so you stand in solidarity with the same people who are trying to cut off affordable housing and education and the like. So we have to forge uh, re relationships from the reproductive rights community to say that you have a ministry to your patients to support them even in this, this kind of decision making. And that's happening to some degree, but I think it would happen more if we elicited those from within the reproductive rights community. Yes, yeah, sure. Stay here for oh, okay. So, <clears throat> So two things I want to say. One is what you've heard today is an absolutely incredible example of the integration of an understanding of the world that surrounds everything that we do in healthcare. You know, both the political, the religious, all of the things that influence not just abortion, but almost everything we do and all the racial justice issues that we struggle with all the time. And so that's, that's my first closing comment. My second is that I've always had incredible respect for the work that Linda has done in our organization. And I think listening to Dr. Parker today, you realize that there's a larger context for that too, that many of us who've been working with her for so many years haven't really appreciated to that extent. So I'd like to close by asking everybody to stand up and give them both an incredible round of applause for what they do.